Welcome back, I'm Tedward, and today, in collaboration with the Bond Group in Waltham, Massachusetts, I'm driving a Series 1 1967 ESO Grifo. And I'm sure a lot of you have no idea what this is, but if you have any interest in Italian car history, you gotta know about ESO, you gotta know about Bertoni, you gotta know about Bizzarini. When Giotto Bizzarini left Ferrari, I think Enzo Ferrari sounded like a pretty rough character to work with because he got in a lot of fights with these dudes. But anyway, Bizzarini leaves Ferrari, goes to ESO. ESO was manufacturing some cars like the Revolta, but they were actually a refrigerator manufacturer, if I'm not mistaken. And he designs this car mechanically to be a Grand Tour, the A3L for L for Lusso. And then Bertoni comes along to do all the coach work and the body work. That's where we get these beautiful lines. Now, Bizzarini is really important because Bizzarini was the chief engineer at Ferrari when he built the 250 GTO, basically the most outrageously expensive car ever made. Just like the Bizzarini 5300 GT Strada, we don't have some fancy Italian engine under here. In fact, we have a Chevy 327 Corvette engine. So it's a small block Chevy, about 350 horsepower, if I'm not mistaken. It has power steering. It's a very luxurious, comfortable car to drive, and there's loads of torque, but it's not as crazy rev happy as those Colombo V12s. And I bring up the 5300 GT Strata because it was originally the A3C. This was the Grand Tourer. The A3C was supposed to be the competition car, the Le Mans car. And then, of course, there's another falling out between Iso and Bizzarini, and he goes off and makes his own company, Bizzarini. Let's go ahead and get this thing started. You've got to hear this engine. sounds absolutely outrageous. Now, before you go and bark at me, we have been out driving, water temp is coming up. I think this gauge is probably a little off because it's just not showing any temperature, but that's fine. Later on, these came with a five-speed ZF transmission. We are dealing with the old four-speed Muncie box, but it's actually really nice to drive. Let's pop this and listen to this crazy exhaust back here. Oh my God, it sounds fantastic. Loads of room back here for storage, but you can see your fuel fillers, room for a spare tire. Good to go for a nice weekend trip. And in the back, while there's not really room for seats, you've got extra storage back here. So you can actually put a few things if you need to keep them out of the way. But the thing I love most about the Bizzarini and this is the visibility is insane. You have the craziest shaped glass and it's just everywhere. So you have visibility all over the car. And this one we've got equipped with some mirrors so you can actually see behind you, which is nice. You may notice I have a bit of a lisp. I just got my first aligners um, for braces and I'm getting used to it. So, so I guess if you can accept Schmee's lisp, you can accept a little bit for me for 14 weeks. Okay, let's go out for a drive. First gear, very tall, very, very tall first gear. But loads of torque. And the steering is nice and light. It obviously communicates to you because it's, uh, it's hydraulic, but it, it is a pretty um, heavily assisted power steering rack. I think these cars got forgotten over the years, and for a while, I don't think they were trading for that much. I mean, I know the Bizzarini for sure was kind of a, a good buy many years ago. Not anymore, they're expensive. Nice short gearing too. I mean, although first gear is tall, the distance between each gear you know, you just jump right in. The brakes feel nearly modern. I mean, they are fantastic. You've got inboard brakes around the back as well. The throttle is very, very light. That's the first thing you notice. It's like a lot of a lot of old Ferraris and stuff you get in and you've got to really bury your foot in that throttle to get it to move. This car is quite the opposite. You just give a little breath on it and it's and it's ready to open that car. 
The weirdest thing though is that like nobody knows what this is. Like nobody knows what the, even car people don't really know what this is. And if you want to impress like people like Bruce Meyer, who uh, you know oversees and runs the Peterson Museum, this is the kind of heritage you want to be able to talk about. But driving around normally, I mean, I don't think a lot of people even glance at it. They might think it's a Camaro or something. It looks a little American in some ways as well. Another thing about the Muncie box is that neutral is a very small area. So if you're not certain, you know, you just want to kind of pop it in a second and make sure you're in the right spot. But you've got a nice T-grip as a lockout for reverse. So you're never going to accidentally, uh, you know, do anything too bad. There's something really nice about a low revving, torquey American V8, and I get why they use these engines. I mean, number one, they were trying to use like a reliable and probably cheap engine to, uh, to use in these cars to go racing and to last for their customers for sure. I don't think it was in the budget to go develop a V12 or license one. I don't know how it worked back then, but you probably have to license one uh, from, from Ferrari or Lamborghini back in the day. I gotta say, if you're a proper Italian connoisseur, this is what you gotta have. You've gotta have an ESO to take to the cars and coffee events. This is so outrageous. There's only four, I think 412 were built. So it's pretty rare. And only the only the people who know, know. That's what's great about it. You know, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to enjoy being a historian if you drive and own a car like this. Ooh, it's running good too. Is the horn Italian? Yes, it is. You'll see some carryover from things too. And I don't know if it's actually the same part or if it's just the style, but like this blinker stock where that's attached to the column, very similar to what you'd see on a Ferrari 250. Now I've got to say the interior engage layout in this car is really lovely. It's pretty nice. Even the Bizzarini, the 5300 GT Strada, those, I don't know, that didn't have kind of that refined look. It almost looked like a kit car inside which is obviously its own charm. But in the day, in the period, you're trying to sell this car up against Maserati and Ferrari, you kind of have to look the part. And for like a small manufacturer, this is just beautiful and so well done. And we've got luxuries like power windows. Oh man, I could, I could listen to this all day. This engine's so enjoyable. Screams, dude. This thing is awesome. There's obviously a big difference between partial throttle and wide open in these cars. There's something about driving these carbureted cars that really lets you know, like, they were meant to be driven full tilt, not gingerly. The car, I mean, it obviously has an American powertrain, so it has some very distinctly American muscle vibes to it, but the chassis is Italian. So while maybe all like the sensations auditorily and, you know, everything going on up front kind of feels American, the actual driving experience it feels Italian. It's really interesting. And it's not unique to Iso or Bizzarini. I mean, we saw similar types of attitudes taken with uh, De Tommaso in the Pantera. I've sat in this car a few times, and whenever you sit in an old Italian car, you get in like the plush leather seats, and you see the seating position, it always seems like, oh, that is gonna be such an awkward thing to operate. The same thing happens every time. You get in, you start driving, and it all just comes together. I mean, the guys who built these cars really enjoyed driving. These were driver's cars, first and foremost. And even though it may be a very unique experience coming from anything modern, whew, man, it just puts you right back in period, and you can understand why someone would need this thing. So do yourself a favor. If you love cars, if you love history, 
The Iso and Bizzarini story with Ferrari is a really good one. This is something that you need to look into. And I think it's just starting to come to light now. I'm hearing more and more about these cars in normal conversation, which I never heard about them before. And I promise if you're talking to the right audience, if you have some knowledge of these car makers, it will go a long way because it shows that you actually care about history. Huge thanks to the Bond Group for the opportunity to drive this Iso Grifo. And uh, I hope I hope you learned a couple things. I mean, I only touched the surface of the history because I know that if I try to go deep into the history, I'm just gonna end up being wrong and I don't wanna piss off the historians in this car. It's, it's worthy of the true tale. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, and subscribing. Don't forget to respect the drive. And I'll see ya in the next one. It's a Series 1 Grifo, and you'll notice that I've got a bit of a lisp right now. Uh, I am wearing my first aligners for braces, so <laughs> I think we'll have a little bit of a shmee vibe for the next 14 weeks, but I'll do my best to avoid it. This car 